Thanks everyone for, for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Brad Wisniewski. I am a, uh, a newbie to the uh, uh, BUC uh, church and I'm your host for tonight. I um, would like to announce that uh, the meeting is being recorded. So please keep this in mind with any remarks uh, that, you'll, that you'll be making. This will be not widely distributed, but it will be posted and available. So for the, uh, the format for tonight, it's gonna be an hour and we're gonna shoot for a, a half hour presentation and a half hour question and answers. Um, what we'd like to do is ask people to uh, virtually raise their hand and then I'll go, that'll show up to me as the moderator. I'll recognize you and then um, we can uh, then, uh, then call on you and, and keep order that way. We ask you to, uh, formulate and limit your question to maybe a half a minute or so. Uh, sometimes the, the questions have run long. We'd like to get uh, our speaker tonight to uh, have some time to, to answer those. Yes. And I'm gonna mute everybody once, uh, once we start speaking here just to keep the, uh, the, cross, the cross talk down. And uh, if you're calling in by phone, then uh, star six is a toggle function for muting. And star nine uh, raises your hand, and I can see that in the um, uh, participant panel here. Does anyone have any uh, questions? So I would uh, like to then announce our, uh, our speaker uh, for tonight, um, Suzanne Paul, who's a past president of the American Humanist Association and a retired UU minister. And as she gives her talk today, she does it as a ceremonial officiant. And Suzanne, I'm one person would like to understand more of uh, the definition of what that means. I've uh, not heard that term before once we get started. And uh, her topic tonight is uh, balancing head and heart. Um, where if humanists have been uh, accused in prior times of being too cerebral and leaving things to the head to people of faith. She comes to us with a uh, uh, bachelor degree in general studies from Wayne State and looks like that uh, she had a lot of, uh, lot of experience with collegiate open overlapping mm -hmm. that looks like studies at the Humanist Institute in uh, New York City. And then uh, Samaritan Counseling Center in Farmington Hills with a certification pastoral care. She served as a president of the American Humanist Association and has been ministered to three Unitarian Universalist churches over that time from Farmington, Brighton, and, and New Hope for a total of 26 years before retiring. And then most recently, the executive director uh, since 2000, uh, I've, I've seen both 16 and 17 for the Center of Secular humanism, which has kicked off a lot of uh, humanist activities in this in the, uh, in the state of Michigan, and we're thankful for this as well. So I would like to welcome uh, Suzanne uh, to our meeting at this point as the speaker, and I'm going to mute everybody, and uh, Suzanne, I'm going to then unmute you. Um, participants are going to be allowed to uh, unmute themselves. And uh, Suzanne, would you please unmute yourself and uh, Okay, am I unmuted? That looks good. Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone. This is, um, I'm not really adept at doing these Zoom things. I haven't had to do very many of them and I'm grateful for that. So uh, bear with me this evening. It's nice, to, I, I see a couple of faces that I recognize. Um, this, I think is the third time I've had the opportunity to speak to your group. Um, the last time I think might have been a couple years ago. I know it was since I retired. 
So I'm very happy to, to be back to see all of you and I hope that you've all been well and, and doing okay. Um, times are certainly very different from when I saw you a couple of years ago after your services at BUC. And since the Southeast Michigan chapter of the AHA closed after five years, we closed at the end of 2019, I sincerely hope that some of those people who had been members of our AHA chapter are now coming to your group and participating. Uh, because I think you may be the last of the um, humanist groups meeting um, in Southeast Michigan. So sadly, humanism continues to struggle um, in becoming the success that I've always believed that it could be, particularly in attracting younger people. Having been involved with humanist communities for nearly 50 years, both as a lay person and as a professional humanist leader. And now that I've had an, retired for almost five years, I've had some time to kind of ruminate on just what we humanists do or don't do um, to make our lifestyle more appealing to larger groups of people. And why sometimes the mere mention of humanism in many circles draws such disdain and rancor. So I'm going to begin by telling you a little story. In late 2019, I heard from a fellow humanist that Target, the Target stores, were selling throw pillows with the word humanist on it. Well, I could hardly believe my ears. So I quickly looked it up on the website for Target and sure enough, there it was, a very cute little throw pillow suitable for a chair or a sofa or a bed. And on it was sort of in an embroidery <clears throat> was the word humanist, plain as day. Well, I quickly went to my Target store. Remember when you could just get in the car and run to Target and not think about putting on a mask and gloves and all the rest of it. And there it was. There were several of them. <clears throat> the humanist pillow. It was about $25, I think, which I didn't think was too expensive. And so I bought it with such happiness. And I was giving such props to the Target Corporation and feeling so validated in some way and elated that they were selling this wonderful item. So I have to show it to you. Here is my humanist pillow. You see it? Can you see humanist right there? Well, it's quite wonderful. And it's also now, I have to tell you, a collector's item because in less than a week, all the pillows had been pulled from the shelves and were no longer available, not even on their website. Well, what happened, you might ask? Well, apparently the Target company received so much backlash for selling this pillow with this very objectionable word on it, humanist, that they had to remove it from their stores. The outrage was so strong that they caved to people's objections to having this godless uh, message put on this innocent little pillow. It became for me a grim reminder that the general public has no idea really what the word humanist means, but they're quite sure that it's something evil and that people who are humanists are evil and not to be trusted. They obviously react very negatively to the very thought of it being displayed on anything, even something as innocuous as a throw pillow. Those of us who identify as humanists probably do have our share of not so nice people, just like any other group of people. There are, to be sure, some not so good humanists. I've met a few of them along the way in my 50 years. 
Like any other community of people, there's always going to be a few bad apples. It, it, but because of a few bad apples, that does not explain the ire that the mere word humanist invokes in the average American. Generally speaking, the American people, I think, are a very forgiving group. When a self-identified Catholic commits mass murder, no one condemns the entire Catholic Church. Or an evangelical Protestant who commits fraud, beats their children, or cheats on their spouse, the entire group of evangelical Protestants, they're not held accountable. Those were just some bad apples in a usually perceived fine group of people. Nor do the citizens of our great country seem offended with holiday decorations, like throw pillows that celebrate their various religious holidays. Target, for instance, sells billions, probably billions of dollars at Christmas time with all sorts of religious and non-religious decorations. Well, last time I checked, no humanist asked Target to remove all the Christmas paraphernalia because it offended them. So let's go back to my humanist pillow. What was it about the word humanist that sent thousands of offended people into such a frenzy? Setting aside the fact that most people are just ignorant of what humanism is, I believe that we humanists have done a very poor job of public relations. We apparently have branded ourselves in a way that allows so much misunderstanding and mistrust and scrutiny as to who we are and what we believe in. If anyone took the time to actually look up the word humanism, you could just go to Google and it would explain. And so I'm gonna just quote from Google because everyone today has a computer and they could just look it up. Humanism, and I quote, is an approach to life based on reason and our common humanity. Recognizing that moral values are properly founded on human nature and experience alone. Humanists believe that human experience and rational thinking provide the only source of both knowledge and a moral code to live by, end quote. Of course, it then goes on to say that most humanists are also atheists, agnostics, or free thinkers. But the word humanist itself is, to my way of thinking, well, it's hardly worthy of this total uprising at Target Corporation over a pillow. So we have to ask ourselves, what's really going on? My observation of people who are traditionally religious or non-religious, but still somewhere in their DNA identifying as Christian, Muslim, Jewish, whatever, that to openly and publicly identify as a humanist is just too scary. It feels too isolating to use that identifier when visiting with friends and family and coworkers, neighbors. Humanism, when viewed in a positive light by non-humanists, is seen as perhaps too esoteric, intellectual, philosophical for the average person. It's not seen as merely a way of, to live one's life like everyone else, except without a deity guiding our way. We get up in the morning and we have coffee like billions of other people on the planet. And for most of us, we do not get up and think lofty thoughts before breakfast. We watch the news, we go to work, we worry about our health, all the same feelings and concerns that every other human being has. The fact that we do not worship a God or gods 
does not make our humanity any less. I believe it is right here at this point where we have as humanists, as an organized group of people that perhaps we have been missing the boat. We perhaps have been hiding our just ordinariness and our humanity. More than 20 years ago, I had a young family start attending the UU church I was serving at the time. And it was a husband and wife and two real nice grade school age children. And they were, they were new to UU and they were new to humanism. But they really loved the church and in a very short time they became members. And I watched their progression through the congregation and they as they were making friends and the kids were really enjoying Sunday school. And after about six months or so, the husband was asked to run for the church board. He said he would think it over. And then he asked to talk with me before he made his decision. And so we sat down in my office and he expressed his concerns about being on the board. He said, you see, I'm just a truck driver and my wife works in a bakery and I don't think we really fit in. Well, I was kind of perplexed. What did he mean by he didn't fit in? He said, you know, almost all of the members of this church are really smart people. He said, you know, they all have college degrees and they all have really important careers. I don't think that I'm smart enough. Although he and his wife were absolutely humanists and raising their children as humanists, they didn't feel that they fit in because of their socioeconomic status. His remarks made me aware of how elitist we were being perceived not, not intentionally, of course, they were being welcomed very warmly into the congregation, but to a family that was, in his words, ordinary. We were, for lack of a better word, a pretty intimidating group. I encouraged him to go ahead and run for the board, and I'm so glad that he said yes. Not only was he a really great board member, but he eventually became president of the congregation. And he was one of the most excellent presidents that that congregation ever had. He was a great people person. And he was a guy who knew how to get things done. And those are very admirable qualities in a humanist. However, from personal experience, I really could identify with a lot of what he was saying. <clears throat> I knew about those feelings of intimidation. I was introduced to humanism by Rabbi Sherwin Wine. He was perhaps one of the most brilliant people I have ever known. Talk about intimidating. <clears throat> but over the years, I was so fortunate because I really got to know him personally. In fact, I worked for him for about five years at the Birmingham Temple. And he was responsible for encouraging me to attend the Humanist Institute, which changed my life then forever. So getting to know him personally was a great gift, but he was indeed a scholar and an intellectual. But you know what else he was? He was a lot of fun. He had a great sense of humor and he was kind and he was really down to earth. And over time, only his amazing intellect continued to intimidate me. I also was very fortunate and had the opportunity to meet and spend some time with some of the foremost humanists of the 20th century because I was on the American Humanist uh, board at the time and president, I was able to attend their conferences and, and uh, I met some extraordinary people. 
I had dinner with Gene Roddenberry. I sat and had dinner with Kurt Vonnegut. I've met Isaac Asimov and Steve Allen, to name just a few. In addition, I spent time with some of the greatest humanist leaders, like Bob Marshall, who was the founder of Birmingham uh, Unitarian Church. He was a great friend of Rabbi Wines, and that's how I got to meet Bob Marshall. And of course, the Reverend Ken Pfeiffer, a great humanist and a retired minister from the Ann Arbor UU Church. He was my supervisor when I did my internship as a humanist leader. I did that internship at the Ann Arbor UU Church. And I served on the AHA board when Edwin Wilson, one of the founders of the American Humanist Association and signers of the first Humanist Manifesto was still alive and so many others who were really extraordinarily smart and well-educated. But what I have come to learn over the years is that it takes more than those intellectual qualities to be an effective leader or a spokesperson for a group. If you want to relate to a diverse audience, and by diverse, I mean people from all walks of life and all socioeconomic backgrounds. We all have to learn to be more than just intellectual in our rhetoric. We must offer them a way to live their life that is meaningful and rich with love and respect and how all of us really can be good without God. And what I've observed and tried to take to heart is that philosophical discussions not always, are not always what's needed in an individual's life. Sometimes we humanists overthink things and forget that human is part of the word humanist. Emerson said, deeds, not creeds. We show the best of our humanism by example. And we do that by stepping up when people are in need and to try to meet them where they are, are most uh, in need. About two years ago, after my retirement, I signed up as a volunteer at a food cupboard. It is a uh, purports to be a secular organization, but it's located in a former Catholic church. And I know that most of the volunteers are Christian and there's always a lot of God bless you's every day between the food recipients and the volunteers. And when it occurs, I just say thank you and I move on. But one day, one of the women volunteers who I knew to be a particularly religious person asked me what church I attended. I told her I was a retired UU minister and a humanist. Well, she looked really perplexed and she asked, what's a humanist? So I gave her a very short answer or as short as we humanists can give. And she said, okay, let me get this straight. So you don't believe in God. And I said, no, I don't believe in God. Well, she said, then why are you here? So I said, well, um, I'm here doing what I thought was helping these people that were in need. And she was just so dumbfounded by that. So she said, well, you know, why, what, what's your motivation for wanting to come in and help out if it's not, you know, doing God's work? And I said, well, I saw that there was a need and as a humanist, I wanted to step in and lend a helping hand. That's the humanists do that. That's what we do. We help when people are in need. So I went on to tell her that humanists are just like everyone else, but maybe our motivation may be different. We're not in it for any kind of heavenly rewards, but to hopefully make a difference in someone's life, a good difference. In just the tiniest way, I think she got it, that someone could do something just for the good of it, 
with no other agenda. We got along just fine after that, <clears throat> at that conversation. And I hope that I was a positive role model for what a humanist is. In 1971, Rabbi Wine officiated my wedding ceremony to Charles Paul. And Charlie and I very shortly after we joined the Birmingham Temple. So this was my introduction to organized humanism. I, like thousands of others, thought I was the only one who had those very different views on how a person could be good without God. It was a wonderful environment to be with like-minded people in such a positive community. Ultimately, we raised our three children in that congregation. Today, they are all adults now. Charlie and I also have three grown grandsons. Although none of them are formally affiliated with a congregation, they are all humanists. And just to brag a little, our youngest daughter, Sarah Bowman, is the first Democrat and humanist to serve as mayor of Farmington, Michigan. Although one's political party and religious affiliation was not part of the election process, I can say without hesitation that the way in which she conducts her mayoral duties are deeply influenced by her humanist values and ethics. It has always perplexed me when many humanists have excluded their children from their humanist organizations. I would often hear that humanism is too difficult for children to understand. Well, I couldn't disagree more. And my own three children and, their three grand and my three grandchildren, they're living proof. They learned from a very early age that bad behavior had consequences. And those consequences generally happen here on earth, not in some fictitious afterlife. And they also learned the golden rule. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That works for humanists just as it should for every other human being. And all of these lessons, I might add, were taught in their humanist Sunday school and is still being taught in humanistic Judaism. The decline of humanist teaching in UU churches continues to sadden me. Children really do need a community of like-minded people as much as adults do. And for humanists, that used, for humanists, that used to be the UU church. Now that humanism has all but been removed from the Sunday school curriculum, children will not have the support system for their beliefs like my children had growing up with humanistic Judaism. I think it was that validation and support my children received growing up that has sustained their affiliation with humanism throughout their entire adult life. Long before I learned Emerson's deeds, not creeds, I was inspired by a quote attributed to some ancient rabbi. And I wanna share it with you because it has always, I think, guided my life. The rabbi allegedly said, we must live as if God did not exist and only we could make the difference. We must live as if God did not exist and only we could make the difference. In other words, whether we are believers or non-believers, it makes no difference. What is important is that we take care of each other and our world as if our very lives depended upon it. Christians often say they have this expression, God helps those who help themselves. This rabbinic quote is saying much the same thing, but he's saying, what if God didn't exist? Just what if, to people who are presumably believers, then who is going to make the difference? 
And he's saying, you have to make the difference. And for us, it's we humanists have an obligation to make the difference. Now, I want to be clear. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm very, very proud to be associated with a group of people who are thinkers and scholars and scientists. It is comforting to know that all these learned women and men are working on our behalf to solve our very real human problems. And of course, we humanists need to be in the forefront of all the social issues of our day. Yes, it's important that we have spokespeople who can articulate our position in an intelligent way. But even more importantly, we need people just helping other people, regardless of who they are, and letting them know a humanist helped you today. Perhaps I've been thinking about this. We could have a little pin to wear that just says humanist. Or we could have a charm on a necklace to wear around our neck. Or we could have this pillow right there in our living room displayed saying humanist for all the visitors that come into our house. Well, it's really cool that we humanists can call so many esteemed and brilliant people our own. I like to think it's good to be smart but it's also smart to be good. And right now, with all the truly frightening things that we're all dealing with, we need to learn to balance head and heart. And I hope right now that the heart needs to be winning. Thank you. I see you clapping, thank you. <laughs> Can everybody get unmuted now? All right, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. You're welcome. I haven't had to do one of those in a long time. <laughs> People have to un unmute themselves, Brad. Yep. Um, it looks like, um, yeah, I, I gave him that capability. It looks like Le uh, Larry Larson had his hand up uh, first. Okay. Hi, Larry. Oh, I can't hear him. You need, you need to unmute, Larry. Uh, hi, Suzanne. Hi. Can we call you uh, Reverend Paul, or can we call, call you Suzanne? Please call me Suzanne. Okay, just the, uh, okay. this week, I happened to rent, see a article in the advice column in the free press and I'm quoting part of it. It seems like it fits in with this this idea of uh, intimidation. Oh, what was it? Uh, Carolyn Hack says, I did not choose my husband because he was an intellectual equal. I chose him because he was a warm, wonderful support of human beings. Smart to be good, yeah, or something good like to that. Be. Mm -hmm. Who I love more than anything else. I can imagine marrying someone not as smart, but warm, supportive, and loving. We people are who people are is much more important how smart they are. So I, in our church, we have uh, very intelligent people that are, and most of them went to college and so forth. So I think it is intimidating, but I don't think, um, like I think you're implying that it doesn't matter that much if you're a brilliant scholar or really very intelligent. Uh, if you're loving and caring and helpful, that's what uh, that's what matters. What do you think? Well, 
I think that I learned a long time ago, particularly in giving Sunday morning talks or sermons or whatever they're called in the various UU churches, is that um, people really don't remember what you say. They, they remember how you made them feel. And so I, I kind of let that be my guiding lesson when I was putting a talk together, I, regardless of what the subject was. Um, I learned from Ken Pfeiffer, who was a wonderful public speaker, very early on that our sermons should try to inform and inspire. So yes, I did try to uh, uh, give out some information on a topic on a Sunday morning. But the bottom line was, how did, how did I conclude it? Um, did I conclude it in a way that people would have some good feeling that they could carry with them for the week? And so I, I do think that it's important. Yes, I mean, you use, if you, if you look at the demographics of who becomes a UU, at, 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 I haven't checked that in a few years now, but generally speaking, they were, they were overwhelmingly white and they were um, college educated people and so forth. So um, yes, that can be a rather intimidating for someone who's, um, you know, uh, a, a working class person. So uh, I, th I do think that it's very important that um, sometimes we, we have to learn that balance, uh, you know, and I don't know if we've been very successful at that, if uh, to this very day, we're still sort of intimidating people away uh, because they think, well, to be a humanist is some lofty, you know, philosophical thing. So um, I, I, I hope that answered your question. Yep. Yes, thank you. Okay, I don't see another hand at the moment, so I'd like to- Brad, uh, Brad I can't raise my hand, but I'll be, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Okay, now I'll be after you then, Larry. Okay. Okay, Suzanne, um, when you were a, a humanist and a Unitarian, several Unitarian congregations, were there theists in your groups? And if so, how did the theists and the humanists reconcile each other? I think I, I started serving my first UU congregation in uh, 1988. And um, I, was, I think I was at the tail end of the golden age of, of humanism in UU churches. Um, I came in as a, as a humanist leader. Um, I was never fellowshipped with the UU. So I was um, kind of, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm grappling for the word. But anyway, um, so overwhelmingly, the congregation were humanists because that's why they, they wanted me as their minister, because I was a humanist and that's what they were looking for. Now, does that mean that there weren't some folks in the congregation that may have had some theistic leanings um, uh, uh, of, of some idea of what, what God meant to them, that word, whatever that was. God was love, God was nature, God was whatever. But overwhelmingly, I was very fortunate that the congregations that were calling me to serve them knew that I was a humanist and that's what they were going to get. So there was never any misunderstanding about that. Uh, one thing I never tolerated in the churches that I served is we didn't do religion bashing. It, 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 I saw that as, as a negative. There was nothing positive about doing that. And uh, so we, we stayed away from that. Um, but the theists, I think, were very happy with the services that I did because I wasn't afraid to... Um, to quote something from the Bible, if, I, if it fit in with my talk, I would do it just as easily as I chose something from Shakespeare to talk about. So, uh, you know, nothing was off limits in terms of what we could discuss, but we weren't going to do religion bashing. And so um, I was very fortunate, but over the, over the 29 years that I served, uh, actually I served five different UU congregations in that time, I saw the decline of the humanist, um, uh, sort of the humanist faction, if you will, within those congregations. It, it was coming from 
from uh, uh, really from Boston. It, it was coming from the UUMA. Uh, people, clergy were no longer feeling comfortable identifying as a humanist because they felt that it it restricted them in getting a position. Because you had to be all things to all people. Well, my feeling about it, you're going to be all things to all people. You're nothing to anybody. So um, I, I was very fortunate that I was able to retire, I think, in the nick of time. Because what I hear now from my friends, what goes on in UU churches, um, that's not Unitarian Universalism in the way that I came to understand it. So um, I think that's really unfortunate. It's, it's, it's like they just um, sort of lost their nerve, if you will, to say this is who we are and, and this is what, how, how we look at the world and how we believe. And now it's just all this sort of wishy-washy kind of stuff going on. So uh, I think it would be a very different um, challenge for me now. I was very, very fortunate um, that I was able to serve these lovely congregations where people were very respectful of one another. I had a, quite a number of Jewish people at the first church I served in Farmington um, who for whatever reason chose the UU church over going to humanistic Judaism, which was really just about five miles away. Uh, so we used to uh, celebrate all the holidays. We did it from a totally secular point of view we did Christmas, Easter, Passover, Hanukkah. We did them all. We had a lot of fun. Uh, so it, it's it's a different, it's kind of a different world now. So I, I know what you're asking me. And I, I don't know what the makeup of, of the UU church is anymore. I, I know there's some struggles that have gone on at BUC over the years. Mm -hmm. Bob Marshall was. Did you know Bob Marshall? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And he was a humanist through and through. Oh, one of the best. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, you know, uh, he and he and uh, and uh, Rabbi Wine and others formed a fellowship of religious humanists, which became the Unitarian Universal Humanist Association. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah. I have a, a, one follow-up question. I, I there are there's one or two members of our church who don't come to our humanist meetings. I say, well, why don't you come? Is it well, aren't we all humanists? Why do I have to come to a special humanist group? We're all humanists. How do you reply to that? And, and, and why should they come? If, if, in other well, words, they, 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 they feel like you do, <laughs> that most of the church is humanist. That probably is probably true. So why do we have to have a special humanist group? Do you, do you, well, I guess I could ask the question, do you, Perhaps they're they're uh, satisfied with the services and so forth, and feel they're they're being nourished that way, and they don't need any further involvement. Could that be a reason? Well, I, that's all true. I'm sure they're satisfied with the, the way the church is is for them. But but so so why why do they have to come on a, a Sunday afternoon when we're at church or a Sunday evening on Zoom? Yeah, and hear about humanism when. Uh, we're all humanists. Why? Why do we need to start? We said, why don't we have a theist group or, a, uh, you know, people from a Catholic background? Yeah, I, I just I think, don't know how to I answer think, that. I think that's a very interesting question, I, and uh, I I don't know that I know the answer. Uh, we didn't we didn't have that when I was serving the churches that I served. Um, um, there there wasn't a breakout group that was meeting. Mm -hmm separate from the whole, the whole group. So um, I didn't, I wasn't faced with that particular challenge. Um, but um, if, if your humanist groups, uh, you know, you have some very wonderful speakers. I mean, I, I get your notifications. And so uh, some of those speakers are really not what I would say are appropriate for a Sunday morning service, but they're great to have as an adjunct um, to, to your curriculum or, or your programming at church. So if there, if those people are coming to speak to your specific group, your humanist group, I I think that that serves a very good um, a good thing for for and, and everybody's welcome. I know you don't say, well, you didn't you know self-identify as a humanist, so you can't come and listen to our group. Um, so that's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. You're very welcome. I think over here. <laughs> You had a question? So I don't have another uh, hand at the moment. So this oh. is Brad. Brad, I'm going to step uh, back in after after Larry. OK. So, um, so right now, uh, the United States is seeing a lot of uh, political action because we have yes. uh, election, mm -hmm. this is an election year. And yeah. some of the, uh, and there's a, uh, a religious group that's uh, exercising a lot of leverage over one of the over the candidates on on one of the sides but the the um so we're all aware of that so maybe where you said that uh the the uu group may not be so good at, at exercising putting the voice out this group is very good uh maybe it's because as you said it's how they make people feel they work with emotions the data i've seen shows a steady decline in the number of people that have a religious affiliation mm -hmm. uh, decade over decade. And I think that uh, that makes me wonder, as you said, that we thought we'd be attracting more young people. And uh, the people that are largely having this decline are now, I think, uh, able to think more for themselves. In the last 100 years, now we can prove with science that some of the things that we'd all been taught, well, uh, we know these things not to be true. We can. Uh, confidently prove these. Um, so it, do you have any other thoughts about how we can go after um, ex uh, me? I just got accidentally exposed a year ago and found this through a, through a TED talk. And how can we expose more people and perhaps uh, invite them in? Is there any strategies that you're aware of in localities nationwide that are working to, to gather more folks into groups and to meet the needs of young folks that are looking for a moral uh, morality barometer where they would previously only seen one that came from a church as your experience at the, at the food pantry. Well, I, th I think that the struggle in attracting uh, the millennials, if you will, that, that particular uh, group, um, all, all the congregations of all denominations are struggling uh, to um, uh, attract that that particular demographic, and there, I think it has a lot. I don't know. I don't have any children in that age group any longer. Um, um, but I, I guess I could use my own children as an example. All th all three of them grew up in a congregation, and not any of them currently are affiliated with a congregation. The, their needs are being met in all sorts of other ways and they're doing all sorts of other things. But uh, in terms of belonging to an organized humanist uh, group, they, they don't. They don't have any interest in doing that right now. So um, whereas my husband and I, uh, that's where all our, you know, we were very involved at the Birmingham Temple when we first joined. All of, that's how we made friends with other humanists and that was where our social life was. That's, you know, that's kind of where our, our life revolved around the activities that were going on at the Birmingham Temple. But today, the competition for people's attention is so great. And there's this thing that we're talking on right now, this computer, that has replaced that human connection. And it doesn't do it for people our age because we're, we enjoy the human uh, touch, if you will, and the companionship of being with other people. Uh, we have uh, four couples that we've been very close with for 35 years now from the Birmingham Temple. And we've, call, we, we've been together during this pandemic. We call it, we're in our own bubble and we all know where each other has been. And so we, get to, we can get together all the time because we know we're safe. If it weren't for that human connection, every every Thursday throughout this whole summer, we go to Kensington on Thursday nights and have dinner. Now we're going to another park because it gets dark so early. But it's important to us at our age that we are able to be with other people. Younger people, they, they do not have that same need. They are very content to get on this computer and Zoom and 
FaceTime and all of that stuff. And that's, that's really meeting their needs. Now, how do we tap into that? Um, I guess TED Talk is a, a good place to begin. But I think that one of the things that the AHA right now, <clears throat> I'm very proud of the direction that the AHA has taken. A few years ago, we hired a, a young man to become executive director. <laughs> and he took that, our, our uh, organization in a completely different direction. Now we have this beautiful building in Washington, D.C. And he's hired all young people, which is great. And they're all very uh, technologically savvy. And they know how to use social media and all this. And then when I was uh, uh, the president, I think we had 5,000 members. They have now thousands upon thousands of not only just members, but people who follow, you know, at, with the computer. And so there's a lot of young people involved in, in the American Humanist Association, a lot. This last year, they did a virtual conference instead of the old days, we once a year, we'd have a conference somewhere in the United States. And um, it was very expensive. I mean, by the time you traveled, you stayed in a hotel, you paid for the conference fees, meals, blah, blah, blah. Uh, young people couldn't afford that. And so we never attracted any young people. Now they have these virtual conferences and they have thousands of people that come online for these. So I think there's, uh, uh, it's going on out there and we're not aware of it because that's not where we are. And, and to expect that they're gonna come to where we are, I think that's just not gonna happen. Uh, but I think we should take heart that it's that it is a happening thing that there are these young humanists and they are very active doing their thing um, and uh, doing lots of positive things, but they're kind of off our radar. Does that help answer your thanks. question? Yeah, yeah thanks. I, I learned a lot. We've got one more one more question here. Okay. Uh, Larry Larson, we'll need to uh, state that quickly, please. We've uh, run out of time here. Thank you. Uh, Susan, uh, I understand there's only one, one congressman that has come out as, as a humanist. Uh, nobody is saying they're an atheist, for example. And the, and the idea of good without God is, uh, isn't going to get you very many votes. But I'm, I'm, my question is, uh, should humanists be more concerned about uh, one's character being loving and compassionate and kind than social action or are they equally important? Uh, what do you mean by social action? Uh, what do you mean specifically? Uh, social justice uh, activities. Well, I think everybody has uh, their own special interests and, and what, what they feel comfortable doing. Um, my days of sort of marching on the front line are, are kind of over. <laughs> I, don't, I don't walk as well as I used to. And so I have to do my, uh, my social justice in a different way. Uh, and so we shouldn't be beating ourselves up if there's certain things that we don't get involved in. That doesn't mean there isn't something we can get involved in. I think, I think either as a, you know, I think that was one of our failures of our AHA chapter is that everybody wanted to be active, but it was very difficult in finding what was that thing that we could actually do? I mean, we had great ideas, but there, but um, age and all of that were sort of uh, holding us back from doing a lot of the things we might have liked to, to do. And we didn't have any younger people that were willing to uh, step in and kind of carry the ball for us. So, um, I, you know, I try to be generous uh, financially when I can, um, not to pat myself on the back, but when I got that money from the government, I, you know, I felt it was sort of like blood money from the government. And so I just turned around and gave it to the, the place where I was volunteering at the food cupboard. And I, and I knew the money could be used there. I, I didn't need that money. And so, so the, I can do that now. But, but in terms of a lot of them, you know, I love seeing when the young people do go out and march, but it's not something I can do anymore. 
so we we all can we all can do something we can you know write letters we can make phone calls we can uh you know do whatever we we can do but if you're asking from the heart you would be promoting loving and compassion and kindness yes that's always in, <laughs> in style in my book even not uh and that only thinks from the from the head, like uh, the scientific method and so forth. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me.